Okay, so we just went over linear regression models using basis functions. We saw that with such basis function, we could actually uh, generate or construct quite complicated functions just by taking linear combinations of a set of basis functions uh, where each basis function was assigned some weight. Uh, what we're going to do in this video, we're going to actually fit these type of functions to data. So we're going to tune the parameters W in an optimal way and we're going to do this via uh, the maximum likelihood approach. Okay, again, we're considering uh, the following setting. We have input variables, x, i, where each x, y is a d-dimensional vector. And I'm going to predict target values. So the corresponding target values are just uh, some scalar value. Now I'm going to assume that my data is generated through some model. So there exists some y that maps each input x to the true target value. That's it. That is this red curve and the red curve is the thing that we want to reconstruct. That's the thing that we want to fit. And we're going to do that with a linear model using basis functions. So that means my output y is given by the scalar product of w with my uh, basis factor. And recall that my, um, my bias is absorbed in this um, weight factor. So that means that my w is given by uh, a bias, w0, w1, up to w m minus 1. And this gives me an m-dimensional uh, weight vector. And now my, um, my basis vector looks like this. It's a vector which takes as input this input vector and stacks, stacks uh, well, the bias uh, basis. So that's the constant one, phi one, the first basis function, which takes as evaluated at this point x the second basis function evaluated at point x, etc., up to m minus one basis function. So also this thing is a vector of length m. Okay, so this defines the linear model that we're going to use to, to model this, this behavior that maps the input to the corresponding uh, target uh, values. Okay, so that's denoted over here. This is our model. It's a linear model with basis functions. And then we assume Gaussian noise around the target, right? So we assume there exists such a true model, but then we make measurements. So these blue dots, they're centered around this true model uh, with some noise variance. And this noise variance has precision beta. So we're going to say that the targets in my data are generated via this true model. So Y, which maps an X to the corresponding target, given some model parameters, plus some epsilon noise. And this epsilon noise is assumed to be Gaussian distributed with some inverse precision or some variance uh, on the noise. Okay, now given this uh, probabilistic approach to things, we're going to come up with a predictive distribution that given some x and given my model parameter, uh, returns a probability for each of the corresponding target values. And we're going to model this predictive distribution via a normal distribution. So this normal distribution with respect to the random variable t is centered around a predicted mean. And the predicted mean was given by my uh, linear model. And it has precision uh, beta, right? So this mean over here is given by my model y of x parameterized by w. So my predictive distribution um, maps up an input x to a, a certain mean and then assumes a Gaussian distribution around that mean. So with highest probability right at the mean, but I still consider points slightly deviating from this. And this defines my uh, predictive distribution. Okay, so that's the setting. And then we're working with a, a, a so-called data matrix. So uh, all my data points are combined into a data matrix. Uh, that's this thing. And it's a matrix of size D by N, right? Because each data point was a vector of length D and I'm going to put them all next to each other and it gives me a matrix of size D by N. And then also have this target vector. So this is a vector of size 
n because for each end data point or for each data point and I have n of them I have one value that I want to predict. So this predictive distribution really describes the likelihood uh, for each target value given uh, well my model parameters and given my uh, input point given my data set. So and that's what we want to optimize and we assume that the data was iid so identically independent uh, distributed according to this uh, predictive distribution. So that means that the joint likelihood uh, can be factorized into the product of all these individual uh, likelihoods. And that means that I get the product over all my uh, predictive distributions. So all these Gaussians with these front factors, all these Gaussians. So all these Gaussians, which were, which have the same uh, mean, well, of course, for each data point, this mean is slightly different because of this uh, function mapping, uh, y of x, and uh, they have the same beta. Okay, so this is the function, this joint uh, likelihood uh, function is the thing that we're going to optimize. And when this is maximized with respect to w, we have obtained uh, the maximum likelihood solution for my uh, model. Okay, so that's summarized over here. I have this likelihood, which is really the predictive distribution evaluated at each of my data points. So that tells me like, that gives me really the likelihood um, of all this data being generated by this model parameterized by this W and this beta. And we're going to optimize it uh, via the log likelihood. So let's write this out. We're going to take the log of the likelihood. The likelihood was given as this, uh, so we take uh, remember, if you take the log, then these products become sums. So I have n times this factor over here. Uh, this is beta over 2 pi to the power a half. And powers, they move in front of the log. So uh, that's what we're going to do now. So the front factor splits in n over 2, because I have n times this term, times log of beta minus n over 2, the log of... 2 pi, so that's the front factor. And then I have the product of all these exponentials, so that becomes the sum of the log of these exponentials. So that term gives me minus beta over 2, the sum of ti minus Okay, so we see when we maximize uh, the, the log likelihood, we're going to maximize uh, this thing over here with respect to W. This doesn't depend on W. So if we formulate this as a minimization problem, then it, I can write it as the solution is obtained by minimizing the sum over all n of t i minus W transpose phi x y um, and this thing squared. So this gives me the sum of squared errors. Okay, so if I minimize the sum of squared errors with respect to W, I obtain the maximum likelihood solution for W. Uh, but now let's just think of this thing as an error, as something that I want to report or look at. What is the error of my model, right? It's the sum of squares errors. Now, this thing, um, in that, that perspective, it's maybe a bit an odd thing because if my number of data points increases, this error automatically uh, will increase because, well, I'm quite likely to make at least some errors. So if I consider more and more data points, my error will increase, whereas my model will could still be a good fit. So there's, uh, well, two things we want to do actually. Well, first of all, we want to normalize this thing then. So instead of one over two, we said one over n, such that at least this thing doesn't change too much when I add more uh, data points. Okay, so that's nice. So now at least if I have more data points, uh, my average error, uh, well, it will, it will be an average error, so it won't change uh, too much. Um, but then this is the sum or the, the average, the mean squared error. So I take the square of an error and usually it's convenient to stick with the same units. Um, let's say I'm predicting uh, meters, then I have an error on the meter and I'm going to square that error, so that gives me a squared meter error, and that's an odd thing. So we want to stick with the same units, and that's why we 
um, usually take the square root of this thing. So that gives me the root mean squared error. And this is an error metric that doesn't change much with uh, the number of data points. Obviously it changes because now if I add more data points, I make different uh, errors. And also the error that I report has the same scale or the same units as the target that I'm uh, predicting. So this is a, um, a sensible thing to, to work with actually. So when people report errors, uh, they typically report the root mean squared error. So what does it look like? Uh, so these are my data points. I have uh, a model, I have a data point, so I can evaluate this model at all the data points. And for each data point, I will make some error, right? And in the likelihood optimization approach, we were actually minimizing the sum of squared errors. So we take a look at all these errors, square them and take the sum, and that's our object objective, which we're going to minimize. Okay, now let's actually minimize the sum of squared errors. Let's find the W that really provides the, the minimal sum of squared errors or equiv equivalently that maximizes the log likelihood. So we're going to find an so we're going to find an analytic solution for W for which the log likelihood is maximized. And remember that um, if you're interested in optimal values uh, with respect to some par parameter, then uh, this means that the gradient with respect to this parameter of the function that you're optimizing is zero, right? So suppose we have this energy landscape or this error function, that's called F of W. We know that at these optimal locations, at these optimal locations, we have that the gradient with respect to W is zero. Okay, so this is a necessary condition for an optimal value. And we're now looking for such an optimal value. Now, the second thing to observe is uh, that our error term here with respect to W, it's a quadratic form. So it really this thing is what we call a convex uh, function, a convex error term. Where convex means that in, in let's say in the 1D case, it looks something like this. And it, it basically means that we only have one optimal value. So that means if we're able to find the W that satisfies this criteria, that satisfies the gradient with respect to W of my error is zero. If we find such a W, then we have find the global optimal. And we find the global optimal then because our error is a convex function. Okay, so let's actually do that. Let's take the derivative with respect to W of the thing that I'm optimizing and set it to zero. Now the challenge in this case is that we're dealing with a, a vector valued uh, variable. So W is a vector and what does it mean to take the derivative with respect to a vector? Um, so we're, we're moving towards this uh, multivariate case. Uh, I'm going to show you how to do this. And really this is going to be an example for how to compute analytically the solution for W um, in this multivariate setting. Um, taking maximum likelihood as an example, because later in the, the assignments, you will do the same or similar thing for the maximum a posteriori approach. So uh, pay attention, this, this example is really to get you familiar with working with in this vector valued uh, setting. Okay, so we're going to compute the derivative with respect to a vector, and we define it to be as follows. So we say that if I take the derivative of a, a could be our error function, with respect to a vector, it's going to be the derivative with respect to the first component in this vector, then the derivative with respect to the second component of this vector. And this would give me a row vector. And this is really a convention that we use. So we say that the, the, the vector derivative gives us a row vector. And actually we may even denote this with this gradient symbol. We say the gradient of A is defined as this derivative. And we say that the gradient is a row vector. And this may conflict with what you're used to uh, for gradients being. Uh, usually you would say the gradient is a vector. Uh, well, we say it is a row vector, so that's really our definition now. Um, it's for us, it's a convenient way of defining the gradient and the derivative, um, especially in this multivariate case, as we will see maybe in, later on when we work with chain rules of matrix vector multiplications. But for now, it's, it's sufficient to remember that we define the gradient with respect to a vector as this thing over here. Okay, so that's what we're going to, to do. We're going to take the derivative with respect to W of 
or error uh, function over here and then we are going to set it to zero. And now let's start off by, let's make it a bit easier for ourselves. Let's use a change of variables. So let's say we call this thing u. So u is ti minus w transpose phi xi. All right, so, so let's write this out. Um, so really, um, a change of variables so I still have this minus beta over 2 i is 1 to n t du of u squared du dw okay so let's write that out so that's really the same front factor minus beta over 2 the sum i is 1 to n of uh, this derivative which was 2u so 2 times t y minus W transpose phi of xi. And this times du dw. So times du dw. Okay, so let's compute this thing. So du dw means I'm going to compute um, the derivative of this thing, so this part doesn't depend on W, so I'm going to take the derivative of this thing. So that will be minus D, D, W of W transpose phi. And now it's getting a bit uh, tricky, right? Because now I'm taking the derivative with respect to a vector, and what I see over here is a row vector. So this isn't truly really compatible I mean, we could still write it out as this is a scalar product. So this is a sum of W1 times phi1, W2 times phi2, etc. And then we could just apply um, this definition over here. But we're going to do a convenience trick. Uh, so we want to turn this, we want to see the vector W, not the row vector W transpose. And the scalar product, we can switch orders by uh, simply taking the transpose of each of these things. So the derivative here is actually the same as minus d dw of phi xi transpose w. So I really I just switched the orders and that implies that I have to put a transpose to each of these uh, uh, vectors. And now you see I'm going to take the derivative of this w and I see a w over here and we know from uh, differentiation that if we see this item over here, we could just uh, cross it out. So this is really the derivative of this linear uh, thing. So that gives us minus phi xi transpose. Right, so we see that if we take the derivative of this thing over here, and we see a phi over here, if we take the derivative, we actually get uh, phi transpose. And please verify this yourself using just the direct application of or definition of this derivative and expanding this maybe you could do this also by expanding the scalar product into this sum of components so if you don't believe me please verify that this is true okay so now we can replace this du dw over there so let's remove it and write phi of xi transpose and we had a minus so this becomes a plus and remember that what we were doing we were optimizing this thing so we computed the gradient with respect to w and this had to be set to zero and now solving this would uh, give us the optimal value w okay let's mark this out for a bit so this was really just helping us with the computations okay so we're solving for the w that satisfies this equation and that means, uh, so we can rewrite this, um, this thing has to be zero, so it doesn't depend on beta, actually uh, beta is bigger than zero, so we can uh, divide it out and also these um, two terms uh, cancel out. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to rewrite this, I'm going to move the ti on to the right hand side, so that actually gives me this equation. Right, so this term, what you see over here, is this product. 
So phi with phi transpose and w transpose up front, and I move the sum uh, over there. And this ti part multiplied with phi is moved to the other side. Okay, so this is the thing that we need to solve. Um, now I'm going to write it a little bit further into a slightly more convenient form by taking the transpose uh, on both sides. sides. Okay, so really this gives me the sum i is 1 to n of phi xi with phi xi transpose. And this entire thing, the product with w, and this has to be equal to the sum i is 1 to n ti phi of xi. Okay, so this over here gives us the system that we need to solve. When W satisfies this equation, we have found a globally optimal solution uh, that minimizes uh, the error, the, the, the sum of squared errors, or which maximizes the log likelihood. Okay, so that's again repeated over here. This is what we just derived. This is what we need to solve. And to solve this, we're going to move a step further into this fully matrix vector notations. So I'm going to introduce this matrix over here, which is called the design matrix. And it basically consists of all my basis functions uh, base function 0 to 1 to m minus 1 evaluated for each data point. So each row in this matrix is the feature vector corresponding to, to the first data point and then the next row is the feature vector corresponding to the next data point and then I have n of such rows. So this thing is really an n by m matrix that, that, that really encodes for all these feature transformations for all my data points. Now let's have a quick look at the terms, what we see in the equation that we're solving here. So um, phi is a vector of, of size m and phi transpose is a row vector. So this thing over here actually would give me an m by m matrix. What do I see on the right hand side? Well, this thing was my vector of length m. So this is a vector of size m. So now with this matrix uh, vector notation in place, we can show that uh, this equation is the same. So now in, with, in terms of capital phi, in terms of our design ma matrix, phi transpose phi times w is phi transpose the t vector, so the vector that uh, captures or that encodes for all my uh, target values. And you can of course show that this is the same because matrix vector multipl multiplication means I'm multiplying a row with a vector. Now this is a fixed vector, I take in phi transpose here, so this become a rows. And so this was the feature value for the first data point, for the second, so I'm multiplying the corresponding um, basis function evaluations with corresponding target values. Um, again, this is something that you can easily verify. So please do so if you um, do not have this intuition yet. So now I'm going to do some linear algebra here. I'm going to um, multiply both sides with the inverse of this thing, and that would give me the solution for W, right? So W is given by the inverse of phi transpose phi multiplies, multiplied with phi transpose times t. And this is something that we uh, can easily numerically compute. Uh, and this thing over here, so this thing is called a pseudo inverse or the more Penrose inverse of capital Phi. And it's typically denoted with capital Phi plus, and it has the same properties uh, as an inverse, namely that um, Phi uh, plus, so the pseudo inverse of Phi times Phi gives me the identity matrix. 
Okay, so really we have, now we have found the optimal, we have found the maximum likelihood solution for our uh, regression problem. And in terms of this matrix factor notation, it was given as follows. Okay, so this gives us the maximum likelihood solution for W, and we can use this W now in our predictive distribution. And if you then want to make uh, a point prediction or like a point estimate for a given input X prime, I can simply take the expected value over this distribution, given my model parameters and my input point X, and the expected value, because we're working with a, a Gaussian uh, distribution with a Gaussian model, this expected value corresponds to the mean, and the mean was described by, uh, via our um, linear regression, via our basis function based uh, linear regression model. So the mean is given by my weights, my obtained set of weights times the basis functions. Okay, so that's it. Uh, so now we have found a way now we have found a way to compute the optimal value for W and we can numerically implement it. I mean, we have numerical tools for computing the inverses and pseudo inverses. So really given all my data, I can now uh, come up with this nice uh, predictive uh, distribution in this um, basis function based regression model. And this whole exercise was also to give an example or to get you comfortable with working in this matrix factor notation but also to get a bit of feeling how does this work with uh, taking derivative taking derivatives of uh, vector valued uh, variables so now i showed this example and it's up to you to gain some experience uh, and for that we de we designed this uh, assignment in which you're going to redo this but now in the maximum a posteriori case